attorney and FOIA advocate was recently handcuffed and arrested at the annual meeting of the Arkansas Bar Association, arrested simply for having a petition to sign in support of our Arkansas state FOIA law. Joining us in studio today is that attorney, Jennifer Standifer. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. For coming up and, and talking to us about this. I'm sure you're aware the issue of transparency in government is crucial uh, to Agreed. us at Conduit. And I know for so many Arkansans, um, so I'm happy to have you here in the studio. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for those who may not be familiar with you and your work, just very briefly, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm just a lawyer and a mom. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds dangerous. I know. <laughs> no, my kids are young. They're eight and nine. So I'm always over committed and underperforming in every area yeah. of my life. But um, I, you know, have spent my 20 year career in law, both working in criminal justice. I was a prosecutor. I've also acted as a public defender for low level crimes. Um, I worked for the General Assembly as a drafter um, for a number of years and served them in a lef- ethics, elections, campaign finance area, state government um, and the FOIA. <laughs> I've worked for local governments um, and I have my own private practice now. Um, and then when I'm bored, I take on issues I care about, like yeah. the FOIA. Yeah. Well, we're so glad that you did. Um, the incident that happened recently in Hot Springs, I think, caught a lot of people by surprise. Very, very strange what happened at that bar association meeting. Um, and if you think about it, in essence, that is somewhat of a political convention in a way. You have politicians come and speak. You guys deal with issues of of government, regardless of, of, of what area that is. Yes. Um, you have people come with their stickers and their uh, flyers. Um, so just walk us through those few days. You really didn't think anything about it. Probably having petitions on hand. The convention, I believe, began Wednesday. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Okay, so walk us through that. So, well, just like you said, the bar meeting is highly political and always has been. Even even lawyers who don't think of themselves as political, I never considered myself political when I was working as a prosecuting attorney and working for the Arkansas General Assembly because I was working for both sides. Um, but it, but it is everything you do in law has a political aspect to it. And so, um, even the meetings, just the things we teach each other when we are teaching each other about the law as advocates who have a position Mm -hmm. that in and of itself is political, but more directly, um, the bar meeting has always had candidates. That's actually one of the most intriguing and interesting parts for young attorneys is that all of the judicial candidates are there. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes house and state candidates are there, house and state rep. And what you see is, um, you see this interaction with with your colleagues that's very professional, but also very political mm-hmm. um, and very civil. Folks wear their buttons. They hand out stickers. Um, I believe I've seen petitions mm-hmm. in the past, um, but we don't have as many issues before now, right? Yeah. Like there haven't been as many reasons to carry petitions as there are this year. Yeah. Um, so it's it never occurred to me that as a member of the bar, um, that I would not be allowed to carry petition or allow people to sign. And not only that, just because of my work with the Freedom of Information Act and Arkansas Citizens for Transparency, I get asked a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, Everywhere I go, I get asked, do you have petitions yeah. on you? I always have them in my car. I wasn't taking my car. My husband's also a lawyer, so <laughs> I wouldn't be able to leave them in the car. Um, I get asked, you know, can I sign? I get asked, do you have extras I can take with me? And so it's important to me to keep those on hand. Um, and sometimes when you go to a convention like that, you just have too much to carry. Yeah. Um, and not not the figurative mom carrying too much. Yeah. I have that too, but it's just physically, I have my petitions, I have my, my iPad, I have my purse, I have my bar materials. And so um, I did the last minute, right before I went to the bar meeting, decide that I had to take all of my PTO stuff out of my folding wagon mm-hmm. and take a wagon, mm-hmm. which was absurd. That looks ridiculous. <laughs> here I come. I know, right? Like, here I am. I'm, I'm a 20 year practicing yeah. lawyer who, like, you know, you wear your suit sure. and your jewelry and you go to work and you're there with your colleagues. And the last thing you want to do is let that mom bleed over into your professionalism. But but sometimes you have to. You got to do what you got to do. You got to get the work done. That's right. So, yeah. So, on Wednesday, when I got there, um, it was all loaded up in the wagon. Um, 
And I made a choice not to bother my colleagues mm. with it. Um, I wanted it available for the folks who asked me. Um, but I also, I didn't want to put anyone on the spot. Um, there, I, I expect that there is some opposition to this. And, and some of it's probably because of clients, right? It's yeah. not their personal opinion, but it's how, who they represent. Um, I expect that just like all of the ballot initiatives, we're likely to go into litigation. Yeah. And so for me, it was a matter of respect for my colleagues um, and just giving them their space. And in fact, I have this sign that was with it that said what they were because I didn't want someone to feel like they were sucked into mm -hmm. it. Right. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to see, well, if they don't want to engage in this discussion, they can just keep going. Yeah. Right? And so I really um, was sort of caught off guard and shocked, really, that there was any reaction from the convention center or the bar. Well, and you say that you did not even, you did not solicit your colleagues, but Correct. that goes, uh, that contradicts some of the stories and the reports that we've received. I, so this, let me be clear, like I, I have not watched all of the videos um, or read all of the reports. I read a couple of paragraphs of the first report and it was so jarring to mm -hmm. me and upsetting that I'm just not ready for all of that yet. Um, I, my favorite job that I have ever had was as a gang unit prosecutor in Little Rock. Um, and I cared a lot about that job and that work and my relationship with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And I have continued to support law enforcement throughout my career. Mm -hmm. And so to, to work with them at, in, in, in as respectful a way as possible throughout this experience and then to hear myself described in such inflammatory terms is really, um, it's really disheartening. Um, and it sort of makes me makes me question a lot, right? Yeah. Like it makes me go back and look at my career and think about the days when I might've been wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I'm just, I'm not ready for all of it yet. Sure. <laughs> so Wednesday, yeah. you arrived with your wagon, petitions, <laughs> you weren't soliciting. Right. Um, were you approached Wednesday? No, uh, Wednesday I was not. And Wednesday, you know, I talked to bar leadership um, about other things that were going on, talked to a number of attorneys, wagon is there. Um, only only talk about what's in the wagon yeah. when someone asks me or brings it up, even with friends. Um, I have a number of friends who work for uh, work for state government because I worked for state government for a long time. And so I don't I don't want to put someone at the secretary of state's office on, on, in a bad position. Right. right? I don't want them. I don't want to ask them to take a position that could that could reflect on what their boss thinks. And so I didn't. Um, and Wednesday was a non-issue. And then Thursday we came back in and was a non-issue the whole day as well. I didn't have any problems, any issues. No one, no one approached me to say you can't do this. Um, I will say Wednesday night um, it, in one of our hospitality rooms, there was one of the presidents of the bar did mention that the convention center had a policy on solicitation um, and then immediately said, but the bar has no position. And so I took that as the bar has no position, right? And my response was, well, I'll be happy to speak to them because they're clearly not enforcing it, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. they're clearly not stopping any of the judges or any of that. And I think we laughed a little bit about the constitutionality of it, that there's a question about that. But but aside from that, if if I'm doing something that violates the policy that no one else is doing, I'm sure they'll come talk to me. I truly thought they'd just come talk to me. <laughs> like I truly thought if I was doing something wrong, they would have the courtesy to just come say, hey, Miss Miss Jen, there's there's a problem with this. Um, instead, Thursday afternoon, about three or three thirty, two employees of the bar stopped me and said, We're just we're just giving you a heads up that um that they are coming to their their the convention center is coming to you about your petitions. And even at then, I was moving from one CLE to another. I was leaving one room and walking to another. And at that point, it didn't register really what was going on. And I just said, okay, you know, I'm, I'm happy to visit with them about it. Um, I, I'd love to chat with them about their policy. And um, the one of the women who I now know to be Kristen Fry, I did not know that at the time, um, was a little more combative about that mm -hmm. than the other was um, and said something about, because I think I mentioned to her that, you know, the judicial candidates had been soliciting and it hadn't been a problem. So I'm, I'm curious where their line is. And she said, well, that's different. 
because they're not going around asking people to sign petitions. And I was like, oh, well, I'm not either. So that's yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> like, this <Same>. is easy. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so I really was sort of clueless, um, possibly naive in mm -hmm. hindsight, yeah. right? Well, because you wouldn't think no. what eventually transpired would ever happen. No, these are professionals. And I have a 20-year relationship with these colleagues um, and with the bar. And nothing like this has ever happened. And so I'm, I'm really floored that it did. So anyway, I go to my next CLE. Um, and, and it's funny, in hindsight, I did pass a police officer in the hallway. And he did not even know me. Like, he didn't even notice. Like, paid no attention. So I've got my wagon that's so offensive that he keeps going the other way. <laughs> so again, right, like, this is, this is not striking me as something that's a real problem. So I get up to the other CLE room, and then the same officer I'd seen in the hallway approached me. Um, he instructed me that, I can't remember his exact words, but he instructed me that I was being kicked out of the bar meeting um, and that none of this was allowed. And um, I was sort of taken aback by it, and but also understanding of his position. And I just said, you know, officer, I'm not going to argue with you about it. I said, but I do think that there's a constitutionality issue here. Um, I'm also thrown off because nobody's talked to me about what this policy is. Who called the police? You know, I said, who called? Because I need to know who to go talk to. I need to find those people. Um, and he gave me three names, um, one from the bar and two from the convention center. Um, and then I said, and I'm, and I'm going to go put this up for the night. Sure. Right. I was like, I'm going to go put the wagon away. I said, I don't want to cause you trouble tonight. Um, and I'd like to go speak to them about their policy and what, what the rules are, but also like, I, I want to spend the evening with my colleagues, yeah. right? Like I would like to get my CLE hour. We yeah. have, they have a, like a mixer, a party that's yeah. by the Friday firm every year. And that's, you know, everyone gets there and visit. So yeah. I really wanted to sort of have that time as well. So um, he followed me out of the building, which I had to go back through all of my, all of my colleagues um, and, and get through in order to get out of the building. And then when I hit the sidewalk of the building, he was like, no, ma'am, you have to keep going. He was, he was very forceful about it. And I was like, well, I was just, I was just texting my lawyer. <laughs> No, I was actually, I was texting John Toll because I was like, he's a, he's a friend and a colleague and I respect his legal opinion. I was like, this is, something's weird here. Am I wrong? Because this, this is a public building, right? Like it's a public building right. and I have a right, right to be here because I'm a member of the bar. Yeah. And, and he was sort of supportive in that, no, you're, you're right. Keep going, right? <laughs> this yeah. is not, for the lawyers, this is still a non-issue. This yeah. is something that can be very easily handled. So I went back, put my put my wagon up, came back, um, tried to tell one of the presidents of the bar what was happening and was really just kind of blown off. Um, but again, given the line, the bar has no position. Hmm. And so I, fine, right? I accept that the bar has no position. So I went to find someone from the convention center. Um, and, and the woman I talked to that evening was actually quite lovely. I think her name was Jennifer Wilcott. Um, she was very professional. I, I sat down, I kind of laid out, I said, what, what is the policy exactly? And she said the prohibition was on soliciting. And again, my response was, well, that's great because I don't want to solicit. Yeah. I don't want to ask anything from any of my colleagues. Um, and so we, we talked for a second. I did express to her that I thought that they had an issue with the constitutionality mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. When I did so, I was very clear. I was like, look, don't, don't take my word for it. Mm -hmm. I'm not your lawyer. Yeah. You need to talk to your lawyer. I said, but this would be my position. I believe that your policy is, one, unconstitutional on its face, two, unconstitutional as it's applied because you're only enforcing it against me. And I have a right to bring my wagon. <laughs> When did she my silly mom yeah. wagon and she was really nice about okay. it and um, she I said please go talk to your lawyer tonight or whoever you need to I said I'm, as a professional courtesy I will not bring this back in um not tonight because I I want to spend my night doing other mm -hmm. things too and you give give them time right like I didn't want to make a scene I wanted yeah. to give them time to to figure out what the law is yeah. and figure out what their policy meant um, and to follow that. Um, and I think I even told her, I was like, I find that typically people want to follow the law. Mm -hmm. Typically people want to do the right thing. And so I just wanted to come chat with you about it. And I truly at this point still think, <laughs> well, you're wrong. <laughs> right. It, it, it just, it kept going. So, 
you know, in that evening, there were judicial candidates with their buttons, you know, still there. And I and I was clear to them, too. I said a couple of times, you know, because they called me and they said they couldn't find their lawyer. And I was like, well, he might be here. There's a day of attorney. <laughs> And it was also important I asked for a copy of their written policy, right. and I did not get a copy of that mm. either. So I didn't get to talk to have the lawyer. Have you seen that policy? I have still? not. I have not. I've heard varying accounts of what the policy says. Um, I've heard soliciting. I've heard soliciting, including petitioning. I've heard soliciting or petitioning. I've heard soliciting and petitioning. But at the time, all they'd really talked about was soliciting. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, you know what? I could solicit if I wanted to, but I'm not a jerk. Yeah. And so I'm just not going to ask. Um, so anyway, we went back about our evening. The next morning, I got a phone call from Jennifer Walcott again that said the wagon with petitions wouldn't have been let in. And so I was like, okay, well, I'll just ditch the wagon. Um, but again, I know that there are people who are looking for me to sign the petition mm -hmm. because they've asked me the night before, yeah. right? They've asked me while I was at this party, do you have your petitions with you? Yeah. And, and I didn't. Um, and so um, I pared everything down, right? Like I ditched the wagon, I ditched the sign. I think I had maybe four clipboards. So it's important to... Um, like when you can't have more than one county on one petition. Right. So so functionally, because these are attorneys from every county in the state, I can't just have one piece of paper of 10 yeah. signatures. It, it is cumbersome to carry around. And so you do see it. Um, but I took, I think, four clipboards and just a handful of petitions. I really pared that down. down the area. Of what? Yes. And went ahead and checked out of my hotel and loaded everything up in my car. Um, and when I came back um, on Friday morning with that minimal amount of stuff, mm -hmm. um, the first place I sort of walked through with my friend was sort of the registration area for the bar. Um, and my friend stopped to talk to someone over there. And I just stood there and waited. Um, and as I waited, a woman, a staff member who I, I now know to be Michelle Glasgow, I believe is her name, um, got up from the registration and came over to me in a very aggressive manner. Um, and she said, um, she goes, uh, what, what are you doing? What are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm, I'm just waiting on my friend to finish talking. And she said, no, this, what, what is this? What are these? And she's pointing to the petitions. And I said, well, they're petitions. And she said, well, what are you going to do with those? What, what is your plan? What are you doing? And I was really taken aback. And I think I said, I'm holding them. <laughs> I'm just standing here holding them. Um, and she went on to, we don't want those here. Wow. They don't belong here. You shouldn't be here. Um, and grabbed Kristen Fry um, and said, what, what, do, what do we need to do about this? You know, and I mean, she was just very, um, she was very aggressive. At one point, I sort of put my hands back and stepped back and said, whoa. And she said, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I sound aggressive. And I said, no, ma'am, you are, you are aggressive. Mm -hmm. You are being aggressive. And then she just went right back into it. And so it was very uncomfortable. Um, and, uh, and, and at some point, because Kristen at that point did say the bar has no position, right? We've got a one liner and we're yeah. just going to keep saying the Thank bar has no right. position. <laughs> Don't watch right. what we do. Just listen to us say <laughs> we have no position. But I'm I'm a lawyer. That's lawyer speak, yeah. right? It's why people hate lawyers mm -hmm. is because we do this. Mm -hmm. But um, I read that as the bar has no position. Yeah. And so I walked away um, and just went to my CLE. And when I got to the CLE, I was then sitting in the room. I was approached by um, convention center staff um, right in between the two CLEs. And I need my hours, right? Yeah. This is I have to have these hours in order to continue my my qualifications as an attorney. Um, but the convention center staff comes in and sort of orders me out of the room, tells me that I'm, I'm, I have to go to Mr. Arison's office and meet with him. And I'm like, no, like this is, this is what I'm here for. I'm here for the CLE. You know, these, these couple of petitions are just sitting on the table in front of me. I'm not hiding them, but I'm also not doing anything with them. Um, and, and I said, but I pulled out a chair. I said, but come on in and have a seat. We have a few minutes before it gets started. I'm yeah. happy to visit with you. But I don't, I, I tried to talk to y'all last night. I tried to talk yeah. to y'all earlier and I don't have time to leave the CLE and, and go to Mr. Arison's right. office right now. Um, and so eventually he did come in and it was just 
it was just strange. Like it was, um, it was forceful. It was, um, he, it wasn't an or else, mm. but at one point he, he did say, just don't solicit. And he started pointing at me and I was, cause I was like, okay, okay. I'm, I'm not soliciting. I haven't asked anyone for anything. No soliciting. I was like, okay, again, <laughs> not I'm a problem. Not. <laughs> right. I haven't asked for anyone for anything. I don't intend to. And then at some point he says, you just have to make it to noon. Can you just make it to noon without soliciting? And I was like, sir, this is bizarre. I was yeah. like, the number of people who have approached me asking about this pales in comparison to the number of times you have approached me right. in a threatening manner. I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what else to tell you. I haven't asked anyone to do anything. I'm being extra vigilant to continue to not do the thing I haven't done. Right. <laughs> And I was just sort of overwhelmed. Um, you in the twilight zone? I did. Very much so. Very much so. And as he left, you know, I just, I sat there and I tried to focus on the CLE. So it was a judicial round table. Mm-hmm. So there's 16 tables and there's a judge at each table and the attorneys are there talking to them about civility and the law Love of it. all things. Right. <laughs> How appropriate. And so as I'm trying to focus on being respectful to the judge and my colleagues at that table, I get a text message that says there are three police officers waiting in the hallway for me. Um, someone sort of like leans over my shoulder and, and whispers that there's an officer in the room watching me. Um, and I've just never experienced anything Mm -hmm. like that. Um, and it, it was, it was very overwhelming and it was very frightening. Um, and I did not know what was going to happen next, but I knew that they had deemed me to be a criminal at that point. Right. I knew they were watching me because like, even when Mr. Arison left saying no soliciting, the petitions are on the table, yeah. right? Like the presence of the petitions never appeared to be the problem. Even then, what he kept saying was don't solicit. Mm-hmm. He didn't say don't have them. And now in hindsight, I know that's because if he said you can't have them, he would have directly violated the constitution. Right. Right? Right. <laughs> so like he can't, they had to find a workaround. Right. But, but yeah, so it was just so overwhelming. And then, and then you've got these officers and then bless her heart, this wonderful, wonderful, very dear friend of mine. She is a grandmother. She is the wife of a judge. Um, she is just a kind and and loving soul. And she comes in and she sits down next to me during the CLE. And I kind of leaned over to see what she wanted. And she said, I'm here because I want to sign your petitions. Mm. And um, my heart just sank. Yeah, Like it just sank because I knew I was being watched. Um, I knew they were ready. They were just waiting for me to do something wrong. Um, but I also knew that my friend has a right to sign that petition, Mm -hmm. the least controversial petition (laughs) out here right now. And, um, and I'm just, I'm not going to be the person to deny her her first amendment, right? I'm just not. And so I knew when I let her sign that it was going to escalate, um, but I had no other choice. Um, the only other choice would have been something that is just wrong. It should not happen in this country. We should not tell people that they can't sign a petition. Yeah. So uh, then after she signed, the guy next to her said, oh, which one is that? <laughs> and I said, it's the FOIA. And he said, can I sign too? And I'm like, which county are you in? <laughs> and so I hand him a petition um, and then they t- call time. They switch us to another table And the officer comes up behind me and tells me that I'm in violation of their policy for soliciting signatures and that I have to leave the building. Um, And I said, no, sir, respectfully, I'm not in violation of the policy. I've done everything I've been told to do. Um, And at this point, I mean, I'm talking to a police officer, Mm -hmm. right? And I have so much respect for law enforcement. These are my friends. Um, I obviously don't know this officer, but... I know that if I voluntarily leave, then I just forfeit my First Amendment rights. There's no recourse, right? If I if he tells me to walk out and I say, yes, sir, it's over. It's over. They they can do whatever they want to us. They get to tell us when we get to speak and when we don't. And even like this is the most unobtrusive speech, right? Like this is not offensive. It wasn't in anyone's face. And like if we're there then what do you do? And so as hard as it was for me to say, no, sir, I'm not going to voluntarily leave in that moment. It was impossible to say yes. 
I couldn't help but think when I was watching that, and you and I spoke before this, um, as you mentioned, you have years in criminal law Mm -hmm. as an attorney, and even then for you, where you've you've seen scenarios like this, or you know how to respond, you know what your rights are, even hard for you then. Oh, yeah. Just imagine. Still hard. Yeah. Still hard. Like, it just, it all went into slow motion, and I still haven't watched the videos Mm -hmm. because I don't, I'm not ready to relive that. I will. I will get there. <laughs> you know, um, but but yeah, for someone who doesn't have the training and who doesn't have sort of the crisis management training that attorneys come with or the legal training that we come with, um, it it really made me sort of look at this again in a new light. I I did not have civil rights activists on my bingo card. This is not what I was looking for right. by any means. I I don't go to rallies. I don't go to parades. I'm not, I'm, I, I got signed on to Arkansas citizens for transparency because I work. Yeah. They needed someone who knew how to, knew how to draft a bill, right? They needed someone who knew how to write law and that's why they called me. And so I came on because I care about it and I know how to write laws. And, um, my actions were not the, the Twitter, TikTok famous actions, right? Like what I was doing was really, truly just grassroots, I'm a lawyer and a mom and I want to make it available to anyone who cares about it. And apparently that's bad enough in Arkansas now that you can get arrested. They, so you were approached at the table. I have watched it. You were approached at the table, um, exchanged some words, but then you eventually were handcuffed and almost like a perp walk in front of all of your colleagues out the building. Um, And I, I think at one point you said I, I these petitions can't get out of my. I did. <laughs> I, was like, oh my I was like, I can't leave these here. I'll just qualify all the signatures, and there's also a felony if I do. <laughs> like in the midst of all this, I was like, "How is she doing this?" Um, but you did, and you mm-hmm. as you're being handcuffed, yeah. you're like, I, "Those have to come with me." Right. Um, and they walk you on in front of all of your colleagues mm-hmm. to the sidewalk, and then there just seems to be such confusion, really, even amongst the officers. Um, what do we do here? What are we doing? They eventually take the handcuffs off. Right. Were, were charges officially filed? No. So they, when, when he put the handcuffs on, he told me I was being arrested for criminal trespass. And I believed I was being arrested. I believed I was going to the jail. And, you know, in addition to worrying about the petition, I was also like, oh my God, we're supposed to pick up the kids at my, my father-in-law's house. And we've got to get the dog and the cats from the vet. And <laughs> How are we going to get back home? What and- mothers and women do. It's like, okay, <laughs> but you probably didn't think with it. comes to home like this. Right. My husband's going to be really mad if we're late to pick up the kids. Because <laughs> he was in the room too and he didn't what? see it. Wow. He was, he was in a separate area. Because he had also seen some of the engagement earlier that mm-hmm. day with some of the, I think with the, with the employees of the convention center and he thought he thought it was fine. Like yeah. everyone had walked away. Um, and so he really nobody, none of a lot of the attorneys didn't respond in the room because I think there were some that didn't know what was happening. But even my colleagues, none of us expected this to happen. Yeah. Right. Like none of us expected that at the bar meeting of all places, a lawyer would get arrested for doing something lawyers do in a room full of lawyers teaching other lawyers about the law, right? Like, it's just so normal that we all expected we would just continue to go through the professional courtesies and it would be worked out until it wasn't. I mean, that was the moment that it became clear. Um, And so it's really been upsetting for me to think about, you know, the folks that don't have that training, the folks that don't know how to stand up for their own rights. Um, I've never encouraged people to be activists before, but I feel like we need to be more knowledgeable about what our rights are because we we are feeling a more oppressive government right now. Yeah. So so that Friday they took the handcuffs off. Um, you were not officially charged, but they told you you had to leave. Yes. And and also I'm still in lawyer mode, right? right. Like I'm still in lawyer mode. I did not want to go to jail. Yeah. <laughs> not yeah. Go to jail. But at the same time, I knew there were certain questions I had to ask them in that moment mm-hmm. to, to be clear about what was happening. And I mean, in, in those questions, it became clear to me that this is now new, right? Like this is now a new objection that they have that he had not raised to me before. Um, it became very clear to me that 
maybe they have a written policy, but I haven't seen it in writing. They clearly don't understand what it means or the constitutionality implications of it, nor do they have any desire to to apply it equitably yeah. to everyone. Um, and so in that moment, I, I did sort of talk to the officers for a minute because I was trying to understand. Yeah. I was really trying to understand what the violation was. Um, and I think, I do think in explaining to Officer Hanley, um, because I did tell him, I was like, look, they said no wagon. I didn't bring a wagon. They said don't solicit. I didn't solicit. I don't understand what the next violation is. And, and he's making it very clear that he's doing this for the bar and for the convention center. And I'm like, but the bar keeps telling me they yeah. have no position. Which I think is interesting that I want to ask you about. Um, yeah. They continue to say we don't have a position kind of shifted the responsibility to the convention center staff and employees of the convention center as being the ones. But, and I think this is so ironic, um, what you were told during those days and the statements released completely contradicts documents, body cam footage, text messages received by and through a Freedom of Information Act request. <laughs> Yeah. And so that's the very thing that you're trying to protect. And that's really what showed, um, really brought everything into light, what really happened. Right. Um, Robert Steinbuck, he's an attorney. Um, we have him on often. Um, he was a he is a big advocate for for the FOIA Act, as you know. And he had a piece recently in the Dim Gas. And he even sent, as you mentioned, some FOIA requests of his own mm -hmm. that really um, text messages such as one between the convention center staffer, Pauline Howard, and Bar Association Fry. I have eyes on Standifer. Do you want her to leave? You know, what do you want here? I have eyes on her. I know that you've said you haven't read everything. You haven't watched the body cam. But knowing... Let me ask you this. Do you do you feel as though now that you were specifically targeted for this very petition? I don't know the answer to that. Um, there weren't other petitions there, right? Um, so so I can't say that. And I don't like to speak for others. I like the evidence to show what the evidence shows. To me, what I think the evidence shows clearly um, is that they did come after me whether it was petitions or FOIA. Um, I would hate to believe that the Arkansas bar would, would, would come after me because of a tool that most lawyers use, right? I would be less surprised if it were the city of Hot Springs. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> that way. But, um, but I don't know. I can't speak for them. What I am willing to say is we are at a time in Arkansas politics that I am ashamed of mm. as an Arkansan. I am a native Arkansan. I have lived here my whole life. I was raised by native Arkansans who were raised by native Arkansans. Um, and, and we are at a point right now where people are just afraid of government. They just are. And, and wealthy and powerful people yeah. are afraid of government. They're afraid of retribution. They're afraid of a misstep. And they're afraid of doing something wrong before they know whether it's wrong. Um, I mean, for instance, no one in government, well, I won't say no one, a couple of representatives have stood up. And I mean, uh, Matt Duffield is a supporter. Um, Clark Tucker is a supporter. Some There are some who have stepped up and supported the, this, this, these measures. But, but by and large, our, our constitutional officers... Yeah have not said whether they support or oppose this. And so I, I do think people are afraid of what if they don't? Mm. What if they oppose it? What if the governor and the AG and the lieutenant governor and the my representatives, what if they don't agree with transparency? What are they going to do to me? What are they going to do to my business? They support me right now. They're my guy right now. What happens when they're not? Um, and that sort of fear from the people I hear over and over and over again, and it's heartbreaking. Mm. It's just, it's not, it's not America. It's not Arkansas and we deserve better. Yeah. Do you, you mentioned that you worked uh, in BLR mm -hmm. for some time. Was this a trend that you have seen um, kind of grow over the years or does it feel like within the past few a couple of years it's 
really become heightened? Yeah, I don't know. I have a hard time speaking to the time at the BLR because I was so insulated from the politics mm -hmm. of it. It's such a strange job because even though you're in the middle of everything, you have no politics at all. Like yeah. you were straight just doing the wall. You were doing a courtesy to everyone. It's very professional. You work on both sides of the issues with every member. Um, and it's really, it's really an insulated, but also lovely place to work. Um, since then though, I mean, I, I do think it's been escalating and I think it's a lot of things that have had it escalating, right? Like Social media is weird. Mm. Like the way we communicate with yeah. each other is weird now. We have less family reunions and more Facebook groups, right? And and then algorithms are just absolutely taking us into these little tiny rooms of people that say exactly the same thing as us. Right. And, and we lose these church discussions we used to have, the Bible studies where, where we disagree with the person next to us yeah. but have a lovely conversation about it. Um, so I think there's that. I think the pandemic pushed us further apart. Um, everyone was scared for different reasons, whether you were scared of government or you were scared of being sick. We were all feeling so much angst. And and I think our politics really preyed on that. Yeah. I think politicians on both sides of the table, um, all over the news and the media, really pushed on us this, uh, this belief that we're different, mm. right? This belief that we we don't work for each other and we should be fighting with each other. And I just, that's not the Arkansas I remember. Yeah. It's just not. We take care of each year, other here. When the neighbor has something hard going on, we bake a casserole. Right? I do, don't we? we? Do. <laughs> I'm the Amber. I love those times. I know. You know? I know. And I, I, more of us remember it than don't. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, the way I am getting that back is I'll knock on a door mm -hmm. and I'll carry a petition and I'll talk to someone I agree with. Um, and if we're at a place that like, that's, that's my today's casserole, yeah. right? Like that, that's my casserole today. And if we're a place that you get arrested for a casserole, then I don't know what happens next. Yeah. We're in bad trouble. Um, you mentioned that you're a mom mm -hmm. and I, I believe that they're old enough to, to have situational awareness, to understand mm -hmm. what's going on. How did you have this conversation with them and what did you say it's so hard. Um, we're going to keep having conversations about it. My boys are eight and nine. Um, so yes, they are very aware. It's impossible not to tell them about it. I, I pulled them aside separately and told them each just mom to son. Um, and when you tell them you were arrested, like it's just the eyes get so big, right? Like you see all the emotions I've never wanted to say, but I didn't go to jail. <laughs> Right. It's just, it was really confusing mm -hmm. for them. But then after that, you also have to say, but I also didn't do anything wrong. Right. And for me, it's really hard because I teach my children that the police are helpers. I teach my children that law enforcement are there for the people and they, they will help us when we need it. And now I have to figure out how to teach them that they are the helpers, except when they're not. And I don't even know yeah. how to distinguish between when they are and when they're not. That's such a, um, it's such a moment in time, right? You, you learn it as, as it happens. I did not expect that until it was done, until I was in handcuffs. And so um, if anyone's got any ideas <laughs> on how I can do that, um, I'm certainly listening because I think we're going to have a lot more conversations over time about it. Well, and um, as you mentioned before, this was a place you never thought you'd be. But then also, if this can happen to you, it can really happen to anyone. And that's a frightening feeling. It is. It's also so strange to me because I I don't think of myself like that, yeah. right? Like if, if you saw my household at 7.30 in the morning or at bedtime at 8.30 at night, like you would, like I am just like everyone else. But but it's true that, I mean, I, I have training. Yeah. I'm, I'm trained to be in that moment. I am trained on the wall. I am trained to deal with high stress situations in a calm and professional fashion. I'm trained to talk to law enforcement, right? I've spent my entire career right. working directly with law enforcement. And so I know how they speak and how they react. And I know... Um, how to how to be respectful um and to disagree without being mean mm -hmm. right yeah um and i don't i don't know how other folks do that i don't I, you're going to make mistakes yeah right you're going to look disorderly 
you're going to look like an aggressor. Mm-hmm. And to see those sorts of words being used against me in a police report after knowing what I went through and also hearing the affirmations from folks who have watched the video. Nobody has called me and told me I was disorderly. Has anyone from the bar or uh, Hot Springs Convention Center, anyone really in a authoritative position with, you know, either association called you to issue an apology? So not an official apology at all. Uh, no communication with, commu- with the convention center at all. And um, there are, so there are usually two or three presidents of the bar. There's the current, and then there's the next in line and the one after that. They call them something strange. I wasn't fully versed on who was in what position okay. when until this all happened. It's very confusing for a lot of lawyers, but typically they all work together, right? And um, one of the presidents, the acting president now has called me and I gave her the whole story um, about what happened um, and and she, in a personal capacity, um, did express that she was sorry that this happened. Mm. Um, there has been no official apology. There has been no apology for the actions of of employees. There's been no explanation for how that transpires, right? How the actions of staff so completely are just opposite of the statement of we don't have a position. Um, I'm now granted I've, I've hired a lawyer at this point, so I don't expect to have an explanation sure. directly. Um, but no, there hasn't been one. Well, and I want to talk to you about that. Um, I mean, this seems to be for many who are looking from the outside in such a civil rights issue. Um, what is the path forward? You mentioned that you've hired an attorney. What does that look like? Do you intend to pursue legal action? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know right now. Um, I know this was a very humanizing and vulnerable situation for me. Um, And I'm, I'm a pretty good lawyer, right? Like I'm pretty good at my job, but this isn't my area of the law. Um, I'm not an expert on, on civil lawsuits or, or civil litigation. And so I, I did come out of this feeling that my rights and my dignity were so violated that I needed legal representation. And so I've hired John Tall and Clark Tucker, um, who are both scholars and gentlemen, and um, they will tell me what I need to do next from a legal standpoint. They're doing their research. They're talking to the lawyers. They're doing their job, and I'm going to listen to them and take their advice. Um, For me right now, we have a deadline of July 5th to turn signatures into the Secretary of State's office, Um, We need them in hand by July 1st in order to have the time to count them. And so for me, I'm just focused on signatures. Yeah. Well, so before I let you go, talk to us about those efforts, Arkansas Citizens for Transparency. Mm -hmm. The very petitions at the heart of all of this. Right. The deadline you mentioned is the first to have them in hand, turn them in the fifth. Yes. This is the last week, really, for the big push. What do you want people to know. Just go to our website and find one of our signing locations, AR Citizens 4, the number 4, transparency.org. Um, you can see a number of signing locations there. Most of your local papers have them on hand, and there are volunteers who work for the papers who are willing to take your petitions and and, and have you sign theirs. Okay. Um, so we just, we need them in hand by then. And if you haven't signed, sign. And if you, if you're not sure, and, and you just you want to talk to someone about it, just talk to someone about yeah. it. I mean, I think that's what's so frustrating to me about all of this is we're at this place in Arkansas politics where we don't even talk to our family about politics anymore. We're also scared of what the person next to us yeah. thinks that we don't do it. But I can tell you right now, if there is one issue that you can talk to your neighbor about and agree on, it's government transparency. Yeah. Has there been anyone? Uh, I just have so many questions. I yeah. so appreciate you coming in. I'm, we're going to wrap it up, but... After the incident in Hot Springs, have you had people come to the group or to the coalition or to you personally and said, you know what, I really wasn't, this wasn't an issue for me. I wasn't really paying attention to the petition or or FOIA in Arkansas, but now tell me what I can do. Hundreds. Like it's really, the response has been amazing and completely overwhelming. Like it's, I'm, I'm glad I have lawyers to handle all that stuff yeah. because I'm, it's been a lot and, and so unexpected. I have second cousins that I haven't talked to since I was a kid 
who have reached out through social media and who are saying, hey, where do I go sign? Mm -hmm. But also, where do I pick up petitions wow. so that I can take them to my church and I can take them to my friends and I can get those signatures? And yeah. so we're so grateful for that help. Every bit we can get, this is sort of the last sprint at the end and and we need everyone's help. Anything else that you, you want to mention uh, that we haven't I think that, that was, I think that was it. I think that's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. But thank you so much thank for you. coming in and sharing your story. We really appreciate um, everything that you've done for government transparency. Thank you.